Hello again, everybody. Peter Maravalls here on behalf of City Lights Booksellers and Publishers, the City Lights Foundation, and our partners at PM Press. I'd like to welcome you to session two of Dangerous Visions and New Worlds. As always, we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral grounds of the Ramatishaloni peoples, also known as the San Francisco Bay Area. If you are just arriving and this is your first session, a few words about this weekend's event. This symposium is inspired by the book Dangerous Visions and New Worlds, Radical Science Fiction, 1950 to 1985. It is edited by Andrew Nette and Ian McIntyre and published by PM Press. Like this event series, it details, celebrates, and evaluates how science fiction novels and authors depicted, interacted with, and were inspired by the emergence of liberatory and resistance movements in America and Great Britain from the 50s through the mid 80s. Now, our second session is titled Bursting Through the Boundaries, Queering SF. It will be moderated by Rebecca Bauman and feature Meg Eliasson and Maitland McDonough. A few words about our participants. Uh, Rebecca is the head of public services at the Lilly Library. They have worked in a number of positions at the Lilly Library since 2012, sharing the library's eclectic and wide-ranging collections with all sorts of visitors. As head of public services, they coordinate and actively participate in reference services, instruction, outreach, exhibitions, and social media. During their tenure at the Lilly, they have taught over 600 individual class sessions on the library's collections, covering topics from medieval manuscripts to modern poetry. As adjunct faculty with the Department of Information and Library Science, Rebecca also teaches semester-long courses on the history of the book, 1450 through the present, uh, also rare book librarianship and rare book curatorialship. Meg Eliasson is an author based in the San Francisco Bay Area. Her debut novel, The Book of the Unnamed Midwife, won the 2014 Philip K. Dick Award and was a Tip Tree long list mention that same year. Her second novel was also finalist for the Philip K. Dick Award. Um, in the spring of 2019, uh, received a Clayton B. Ofsted Endowed Distinguished Writer in Residence at the Truman State University and is also the co-producer of the monthly reading series, Clitterary Salon. Maitland McDonough is a film critic and the author of several books about cinema. She is the author of Broken Mirrors, Broken Minds, The Dark Dreams of Dario Argento, and works of erotic fiction and erotic cinema, as well as providing DVD commentaries for various films. Her essays have appeared in numerous anthologies. She is also the founder of 121 Days Books, which became an imprint of Riverdale Avenue Books. So before we begin, I would like to remind you, we will be posting links with which you may purchase copies of Dangerous Visions and books by our featured authors. So please welcome now Rebecca Bauman to get our session started. Thanks so much, Peter. I am super, super excited to be here and chat with Meg and Maitland. Um, I am speaking from the land of the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, and Shawnee people and recognize them as the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. And I'm going to start us off with a big question. Uh, much ink has been spilled on defining science fiction, of course, for over 100 years now, and just as much on the term queer, LGBTQIA+. Um, and I don't want to get too wrapped up in definitions. We could easily spend an hour on that. But I want to ask you both what queer science fiction means to you, and also have you both tell us a little bit about your relationship to the genre as a reader, writer, practitioner, historian, theorist, et cetera. Okay, I'll start. I'm Maitland McDonough, and I am, first of all, somebody who grew up reading science fiction. When I was a teenager, science fiction was the kind of fiction that spoke to me in a way that nothing else did. I subscribed to the magazine of science fiction and fantasy. I bought the Dangerous Visions collections edited by Harlan Ellison, and they were really formative for me because they were science fiction stories that were a great deal more daring than much of what you read in the magazines. They were particularly 
more inclined to deal with sexual issues than I think most of the things that I read in magazines. So I've always remembered them vividly. Science fiction, however, was actually never my favorite genre. Uh, it was uh, probably more mystery, thriller, detective novels that I really loved. But gay science fiction novels are just fabulous for me, first of all, because they are all about sex. And yes, they have the futuristic, futuristic landscapes, the futuristic governments, but it's really all about sex in the future and it's really, really gay. Oh, I love that. Uh, I grew up reading science fiction and think of it as my primary genre, although, when I was a kid, I didn't understand that science fiction and fantasy and horror were necessarily separate uh, categories, and they're really not. They're really only separated for marketing purposes. And we think about, I grew up in the 80s, so I think about Alien being both a great horror movie and a great science fiction movie, and I, I saw all those stories the same way. So I got brought up on Star Trek, where everybody was just a little bit gay, but also very communist in the future. <laughs> And then I started reading the magazine of fantasy and science fiction and Omni and analog and weird tales and the stuff that was available back then. And there was something different about it from anything else, not the least of which was the way it looked at gender and sexuality. So when I thought about the kind of writer that I'd like to become and the kind of stories that I wanted to tell, I knew where it was safe to tell them. And here we are. Excellent. And I, I want, as we're talking, I think, you know, we definitely want to sort of generate some some titles for people to think about. So one way to kind of start us off with that, um, I wanted to ask you if there was a, a first, you know, queer science fiction text that you remember, or if not the first, um, you know, one that has had a huge impact on you or has been especially formative. I mean, I think a lot of these these books and other texts do kind of form these kinds of awakenings, sometimes a queer awakening within ourselves. Sometimes, you know, for me, it was kind of like, wow, uh, this genre that I that I love and know can also be queer. So what are sort of the early or, or hugely influential texts for you? Well, I think for me, one of the most influential texts was a series of books. There are three of them. <clears throat> excuse me, the 2069 trilogy. Mm -hmm. First of all, I, come on, it's a great title, although that's almost a given in this world of writing. But I really love the 2069 books because there are three of them, which means that there is some really, really serious world building going on there. And all of it very much reflects American life in the 70s. But which means there's a lot of group marriage. Group marriage is now not only legal, it's the only kind of marriage anybody does. Everybody wonders how on earth people used to just have a single spouse. So people are in groups of five, six, seven, and just can't see how it worked before because now they have this great group dynamic. And, and when somebody's in a bad place, there are lots of other people to help them and they can certainly have really wonderful romps. They don't all have to be involved all the time. You, know, you can pair off, but the community of your marriage as a whole, which is so very 70s. And they're also tormented by the Humphrey Society, which is, a, which is that world's version of organized homophobes who pay homage to Anita Bryant. So clearly everybody was thinking Anita Bryant and her, cur her crusade against homosexuality. But the Humphrey Society works just fine as a stand-in. And they're actually great science fiction adventure stories. They're, they're terrific fun. So they were definitely one of, the, one of the, the cornerstones of my understanding and liking science of gay science fiction. I have a couple of things I have to mention. Uh, I have to mention The Female Man by Joanna Russ, uh, which found its way into my hand because of a used bookstore and you know everything's 50 cents in paperback. And I was so intrigued by the title, I had to have it. And it sort of pointed me down the road to other books. Uh, I got a collection with Houston, Houston, Do You Read in it, uh, which turned me on to Tiptree as a, as a writer and more of the genre. And then I think something has to be said for works that aren't explicitly queer, but lead you in that direction anyway. Stranger in a Strange Land did that for me as limited as, as that author is. Uh, it, was, it was present and group marriage is present and non-normative sexual relations are present. 
I also am a huge fan of a slightly lesser known 90s science fiction book called The Fifth Sacred Thing. It's about a post-apocalyptic eco-utopia San Francisco where everyone is queer and there's a lot of group sex. And I moved here because of that book. <laughs> Not exactly as advertised, but it's had a, it had a huge impact on me as a person and as a writer. Those are all fantastic titles. Um... And for those of you who don't know, I put in the chat, the 2069 trilogy is by an author named Larry Townsend, and those were published by uh, Greenleaf Press, one of the great smut publishers of the 20th century. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, I was trying to think of, of like, what was my first queer sci-fi? And I, I fell on Ozma of Oz, which is not really sci-fi and not really queer, but it is. It is. It is. <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, and any other sort of just titles that you all want to throw out for people to like, you know, write down, check out, go to your library, like make sure you, you look at this queer science fiction. Uh, well, for me, well, you go. It's, uh, absolutely everything by Samuel R. Delaney, who's also speaking as part of the symposium. He cannot be oversung. He was openly queer in his science fiction writing like back in the 60s back when it was really hard to do it back when it would cost you rejections and uh, and he was great at it and he does not hold back the last time I saw that dude in person he was telling a story about hooking up with a guy on scruff and giving up because the walk was too far <laughs> <laughs> he's incredible give him his flowers while he's still alive <clears throat> And uh, Nello Hopkinson, uh, who is uh, currently a professor, I believe, at the University of California and a, an incredible writer. Uh, I think Ganger Ball Lightning is one of my favorite stories. Uh, it's, it's a body swap story, which I'm a huge sucker for, which has incredible implications for queerness and transness and for the examination of everybody's sexuality, even if you think you're very normal. Get into it. And any others that you want to throw out there, Maitland? I don't even know where to begin. Uh, <laughs> I honestly don't because, again, science fiction is such a perfect thing for gay writing of the 70s because it is all about imagining how the world could be different mm -hmm. and how the people's perception of sexuality could be different and how homosexuality could be normative rather than a deviation from the norm with deviation definitely being the, the key part of that, that phrase. Um, they, I, they, the, the gay science fiction books are sometimes very funny. Uh, the sex with aliens part can be very funny, but of course, as in Star Trek, they encounter a universe of vaguely humanoid, at, at the very least, aliens. So it's all possible. You could figure out how it could be done. So there's one novel, the name of which is escaping me right now, in which the aliens are these beautiful feathered humanoid creatures whose plumage is just the biggest aphrodisiac in, in the universe. Everybody just adores them and they're fabulous. And they're also really, really nice. But it's except... Jim Varley? Oh, go on, go on. Sorry, I thought it might be Jim Varley, go on. No, but it, and there is one novel in which a crew member of a visiting human ship winds up being accused of rape. And I mean, they're horrified, but they don't have any mechanism for executing people or punishing them in any significant way. And so what they decide to do, which is probably not the nicest thing in the world, is put him in a really nice cage and let him starve to death. So they're not committing an overt act of violence. And of course, the wonderful twist here is that all of his friends on the spaceship have to figure out some way to help him. They're allowed to visit him frequently, but they can't carry anything in and they can't wear any clothes in case they might disguise something Can you see where this is going. Mm -hmm. Yes, this becomes all guys have a protein rich source that they can share with their friends, but they're all not gay. <laughs> they, they keep swearing that throughout. It's not a gay thing. It really isn't. It's just, we've got to help out our buddy. <laughs> Yeah, and that one fun. is. I think that one is is hung in space. Yes, that is am hung I right? In space. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> what a title. I love I mean, you got to get the title in there. Absolutely. Um, yeah. It's yes. uh, it is a vastly entertaining read. I love hung in space. It's uh, the Ruvians, I believe, are the aliens there. So next big question, um, and you know this is going to take us, you know, into some serious territory. We're living in a time where queer people have unprecedented visibility, for sure, but also are under unprecedented attack. Um, just two 
of course, very, very recent examples, the don't say gay bill in Florida, and the, to my mind, inhuman sadistic attack on trans children and their parents in Texas. Um, so what role can science fiction take in, or fiction in general, um, in addressing these attacks on our rights, our very existence? Um, how can it, uh, can it change people's minds? Can it bring awareness? Kind of what, how does science fiction interact with the larger world today and in a, in a historical context? Uh, Meg, if you want to take that first, I'd like to think about that a little. Okay. There is a piece of art by an artist whose name I can never remember. I believe he's a Mexican sculptor and it's called the power of a book. And the sculpture consists of a perfectly stacked brick wall except that in the middle of the brick wall, someone has put a book under the very first line of bricks. So you get an effect that ripples an entire brick wall so that the whole thing moves around it. <clears throat> it's really difficult to say what the power of a book or a story is because you can't directly affect legislation with it. You can't remove bad cops from the system with it. You can't get anybody out of jail with it. You can't feed the hungry with it. And yet it warps the entire world around itself. There are so many books that represented to me when I was younger and still do now an open door, uh, another way to think about the world, another way to get around things the way they've always been done, the way they always should be done according to the people around me. These books have to exist in science fiction, in fantasy, in literature in general, so that that door stays open. And what they're capable of doing is immeasurable because what's more powerful than a changed mind? I would say, that one of the things that always appealed to me about the vintage books about which I'm speaking is that they were a product of a time when gay people in America and indeed all over the world were actively fighting for their rights. They were fighting to be seen. They were fighting to be seen not as some deviation from the norm, but just as regular people, people with jobs, people with families people who had trouble paying the rent on their apartments because the rent was too damn high. Mm -hmm. uh, they were just, but they were being seen as actively undermining American norms, which were being defined in an extremely narrow way. Adult fiction generally has always spoken to people who feel that their sexuality is somehow not acceptable, that if people know about whatever it is they're doing, that it will make them pariahs, or in the case of gay men and women, more pariahs than they already were. But gay adult fiction was just, it certainly had its share of problem books, but it was also full of genre fiction in which people imagined worlds in which being gay was not such a big problem, or if it was a problem, it was a problem that gay people were overcoming in one way or another. That's why gay genre fiction in particular appealed to me because you know, a gay vampire novel actually is not usually about politics. It's about being a gay vampire. It's about <laughs> fucking and sucking, basically. Uh, you know, a gay, a gay novel based uh, about space exploration is about exploring space. And in all of the gay science fiction novels I have, sex is definitely the language of diplomacy. So in the gay books, it's gay sex that is the language of diplomacy. It's how you open a conversation and then continue that conversation, one hopes, to a positive conclusion with alien beings. And that there were books you could just, you could buy in any book that sold gay books, certainly, and that you could buy in a lot of books that sold adult books. Although as we were discussing before this, this panel started, you often had to know who to ask about them and they would be under the counter or they would be in a section in the back and there would be a little rope that divided it from the rest of the bookstore so that you didn't accidentally wander in there and have your mind blown by however that mind blowing affected you. Yeah, and especially, yeah, relevant also with, you know, everything that's going on right now, attacks on libraries and censorship of, you know, wanting to, um, I mean, in, in, in my state, Indiana, right now, there's a, a law being considered that would make it, uh, librarians could go to jail, basically, for providing queer material to uh, students without their parents' consent. So, I mean, this is, 
the horrifying reality that that we live in and i think that the existence of these books is is so important there was a great discussion in the last panel um about this idea of, of pleasure activism, which is a term that, that comes from a book by uh, Adrienne Marie Brown. Um, and this sort of idea that, that we can, you know, even these books, like, like the books that you write about Maitland that seem almost silly or ridiculous, right? And they're like, you know, uh, semen as a, a healing protein, but there is this kind of power and connection in, you know, easing our pain in the cruel world and comforting each other in, you know, making these connections. Um, a, an erotic connection can be uh, the start of a form of resistance, right? So um, these books become these very important and powerful little seeds to much larger kinds of movements of connections. Um, and yeah, anyone who, who has, has grown up um, really any time before recently probably has stories about how they found these things in kind of secret ways, whether it was the back room of a bookstore or, you know, the librarian who, who just saw you and was like, maybe you should, maybe you should take a look at this one over here. This might be for you. You know, one of the things actually that I think is important to talk about when you talk about gay adult books is the enormous part <clears throat> that mail order mm. played in disseminating this kind of literature. Mm. Because frankly, an awful lot of people didn't live in a town or a city or even a general region where you were likely to be able to go to a bookstore and buy a gay adult book. But mail order meant that these books could be shipped all over the United States. And that was something that was recognized relatively early <clears throat> by people who wanted to police not just gay sexuality, but any sexuality at all, mm -hmm. and produced an enormous group of pressures that were designed to keep people from sending books through the mail from using the post office as a vehicle for spreading perversion and- Obscenity laws. Obscenity laws, exactly. The obscenity laws were really, really difficult. That's the gays. Yeah, they were, they were the worst, right? And, and yet mail order was the primary way that these books were being dis distributed. So it was a huge, huge issue for publishers. Mail order was also the primary right, way for members of the trans community to contact one another and share information on where to find sympathetic surgeons and how to obtain hormones. And in that one type of oppression and control, they were affecting much more in the community than our access to, to racy books. They are in fact, restricting all access to community. And those, those measures, Rebecca, that you were talking about to ban queer books, uh, I want to stress that that is not just adult queer books that they're talking about. It is not even just books that have explicit sex acts in them. One of the most recently challenged titles is You Should See Me in a Crown, which is a YA novel about a girl who happens to be queer and barely mentions it throughout the course of the book. She just is. And that enough is to get it on, that's enough to get it on the list of about to be banned. So these are very serious measures, measures of control. This is not about keeping children away from pornography. This is about silencing queerness in all its forms. And particularly, as you just said, silencing it for people who are, who are young, for teenagers, right. who may well not have ways of going out and meeting other gay people, but who can buy a book or go to a library and read a book. Yeah, that's a kind of access to a world that I think could be a lifeline just by telling you that, no, you're not alone and you're not the stereotypes that you might see in movies or on TV shows, which are certainly not as vicious by and large as the stereotypes that you used to see earlier, even ones that weren't vicious. I mean, the funny gay friend has been a stereotype in sitcoms, certainly going back to the 70s. And, you know, the funny gay friend was never a bad guy, but he was his purpose was to be funny, not to just be a gay person who was part of this group of friends. So having access to anything that counteracts that kind of modeling is hugely important. Still is, even though we're beyond mail order, we're still, we have the same choke points today. And it's brought so much more attention, you know, having, you know, having this so much queer YA lit, um, speculative and otherwise there's there's so much it's just 
it warms my heart every day that there's so much more. Um, but that has brought so much more attention and scrutiny um, onto the genre, onto queer literature in general, because um, it is available to younger people, which is, of course, as I'm sure so, so many people in this room uh, know, has been a lifeline to us as children, could have been more of a lifeline to us if, if it had been available. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a, a big question. Um, and that kind of ties in, I wanted to talk, and this is, um, this is mostly a question for you, Meg. Um, I, I just finished Find Layla, which I, like, I don't even know if I'm ready to talk about it. It, it destroyed me in the best way possible, but like, wow, what, it's an incredible, incredible book. Um, this is uh, Meg's most recent uh, novel, not speculative fiction, but um, it, it does have, I think, elements certainly of, of horror, and it's just kind of in your broader kind of queer speculative framework. Um, but it made me think a lot about how much we use literature to process trauma, both for writers and for readers. And I wanted to see if you had anything that you wanted to talk about, you know, with, with how fiction can kind of help us deal with personal trauma or bringing it to Maitland as well, sort of cultural trauma. Uh, there's a great quote by Stephen King where he says that fiction is the truth inside the lie. And I, I find that that balancing act between telling the truth and telling amusing lies is the best way to both to write effective fiction that people really connect with. It's weird to say that I love that my book destroyed you, but thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and also to get it out of, of myself. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed, especially running a live show in the San Francisco Bay Area and trying to pay as many queer writers as possible, is that young queer writers are often performing unreconstituted trauma as a form of art. And there's nothing wrong with that, but there is a more refined form of it when you've lived with your trauma long enough to be able to observe it as a, at a distance and to turn it into something crafty. So I think my writing has been really useful for that, both in Fine Layla, which is primarily about a, a childhood spent in poverty and in early, early adolescence discovering that the world is not for you and never will be. And also in my science fiction, where I am processing the trauma of what it is to be assigned female at birth and to be viewed as a receptacle for public use before being a human. And, uh, and also what it is to be queer in a universe that is always focused on the continuation of the species and what happens when that's not your main goal. I think that one of the great gifts of writing is that it pulls these things out of you like splinters and then they're out in the world and you can't change them and you set it and no one can take it away from you. One of the things that I really loved about these gay adult books was precisely that they were normative. There are certainly a lot of gay adult books that are about problems that went with being gay at the time they were written. But the genre books, not so much. The genre books often take place in worlds where you wouldn't even know there were any straight people. And if you do know there are straight people, maybe they're a problem, but they're not a problem that is an overarching one that defines every aspect of the characters' lives. And it's one of the things that when I was reading them made me think, wow, this is a real body of work that is not only hugely entertaining, and it really is, they, the, the best of those books are hugely entertaining. Some are much more serious than others, but they're all really, really good reads, right? All is perhaps a slightly too strong word, but the overwhelming majority of them are really good reads. But the genre books are, very much about not even imagining a world in which being gay isn't an issue. They're just, a lot of them are stories in which gay isn't an issue. All kinds of other stuff is, but the norm in the fictive world is everybody's gay. I love that, um, the metaphor of, of pulling it out like a splinter. That's this, uh, beautiful way to think of it on a personal level and I think that really like applies to this this cultural level as well like we need we need this genre um as a way to grapple with the things that that we feel and experience um kind of on the other side of things you know I think 
queer speculative fiction can also be a place for profound and life-changing expressions of queer joy. Um, do either of you have examples that you'd like to bring forward of, of texts or moments um, where you see that, you know, um, you know, sort of transformative moment of, of queer joy uh, in fiction? I would say Meg should go first here. I immediately thought of Annalee Newitz's book, The Future of Another Timeline, which has beautiful, triumphant queer moments in it. I absolutely love that. Uh, Nino Sifri's Defect, uh, which is minimum wage and maximum weird, like what if a portal to the center of the universe opened up in an Ikea? <laughs> Not just queer joy, but working class life is shit joy. I'm a huge fan of all of that at the intersection. I'm also thinking of Sarah Gailey, Upright Women Wanted, which is kind of a desperate Western, but also cont contains, and so does The Only Harmless Good. Nope, nope. What's the name of the book? The one with the hippos. Oh, uh, it's a long title. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a series of novellas by Sarah Gailey. Uh, I was thinking of The Only Harmless Great Thing, which is Brooke Bolander, and that's about radium and elephants. And I love that, but it's not, it's Sarah Gailey's hippo books. Anyway, Sarah Gailey <laughs> hippo, if you, if you Google that, you will find it. Uh, has queer joy, has fat joy, has uh, river of teeth. Thank you very much, Kevin Black. Thank you. <clears throat> Spectacular, uh, specu speculative work with queer joy in it. Uh, David Demchuk's most recent Red X, uh, which is about a serial killer, actually. And, uh, and the incidents of unexplained deaths in the gay community. And it's really quite dark and difficult, but there's moments in there that are just about the purity of attraction and the way you get wrapped up in the obsession with another person. And he describes it so beautifully. Uh, Sam J. Miller, same thing, scary books, beautiful relationships inside those scary books. This is my favorite game. I could play it all day. Uh, uh, Joel Gomez, The Gilda Stories, uh, Time Traveling Lesbian Vampire, Lots of Blood, also beautiful, sexual, excellent moments between characters. Whew, Maitland, jump in. I'm going to do this forever. <laughs> yeah, there's actually one book that is very much coming to mind now, and it's a book by a writer named Clay Caldwell, whose real name was George E. Davies, who was prolific and adept in, in a number of genres within the adult genre arena, but he wrote a book relatively late in his adult career called Queers Like Us mm. that is about two gay guys who are a little bit older than the protagonists of those books often are and who have lived through the revolution and who are both blue collar. One of them's a mailman and I forget what the other one's job is. Might be a truck driver. Truck drivers, by the way, feature in a really big way in, in gay adult novels. Truckers are definitely an erotic fixation. But the two of them have a series of conversations throughout this book. And one of the big ones is, you know, remember when, when people used to call us queer and you would punch them in the mouth? But now we're supposed to be queer. And that's the beginning of a conversation about not understanding a new world of being gay and a new kind of language and a new way of approaching it because they're all their characters who grew up or came of age more importantly at a time when being gay was a battle mm -hmm. and sometimes it was a very subtle below the surface battle and sometimes it was a really overt battle and the reading this book that is still an erotic novel definitely that is basically about two guys who almost feel as though the revolution kind of left them behind in some way, because it's full of language and it's full of clearly people who are younger than they are who have an entirely different take mm. on what it means to be gay, right down to what you call yourself. You know, they, I mean, they're, they're saying, okay, we have to call ourselves gay now, we can't call ourselves queer anymore. And it's not the biggest deal in the world, and yet it is because queer is the term that they used to identify themselves through a really difficult time. And now that you can just tell, they, they just kind of don't want to let go of it because somebody else says gay is a better way to, to describe yourself. And as with a number of these books, that's some serious freight for an adult novel to be hauling. And indeed, to put in its title, Queer Like Us, that's, that's what this is going to be all about. 
that's a sentiment that I've heard from many uh, queers of the old generations who everything was a fight for them and having one through can be quite alienating, especially when they perceive that the younger generation doesn't appreciate how difficult things truly were and how much the language had to shift to suit people's assimilation of the larger culture. It's uh, it can be heartrending. I've heard people talking about it at Twin Peaks over very weak drinks when the sun's still out. <laughs> Uh, as long as we're talking about excellent queer books, I can't let it go without saying this one came out this week. It's called Manhunt by Gretchen Felker Martin. Manhunt is one of the best, most visceral things I've ever read in my life. It's about a post-apocalyptic wasteland where anybody with too much testosterone in their system becomes like a dog zombie. And there are roving gangs of trans women hunting down men to eat their testicles, which is where all the free estrogen in their body is stored. It's really grim. There's a ton of body horror. There's an army of turfs. There's, there's a turf navy. It's so hard to read. And at the same time, Gretchen Felker Martin, hyphenated is the author's name, and it has T for T romance. It has beautiful connected sex scenes. It has really hot sex scenes. It's got an older fat Indian woman who's a fertility doctor who also gets fucked in the book. I cannot recommend it enough. The cover is two plums in a bag. The tagline is the end of the world is nuts. You need this. You know, yeah, I'll funny. second that manhunt. Like oh. you must, you must get it. It's so good. <laughs> also JK Rowling dies in it and it's so funny. Oh yes. That's actually reminding me of one of my favorite, uh, it's a gay detective thriller uh, called Maneater. And the, the hero is a, a guy named Jake, Jake Gold, who is a Vietnam War veteran, who has grown up in a very closeted life and is now living a very open life. And he finds himself sicked on the case of a killer who is dubbed the Maneater. Uh, yeah, who's who's killing gay men and and mutilating them and Jake has to come to terms with a lot of things about himself and is also saddled with a straight guy as his partner who's just an asshole so he spends a lot of time not beating up his partner <laughs> because he realizes that's not constructive but he just does not want to deal with this guy because he's such a jerk but Jake is one of my absolute favorite characters in any of the adult books I own mm. because he's always, he's very ruminative. So there are long passages in which he's thinking about stuff. But my favorite sentences always begin with, I'm not usually a fan of, and it's always something sexual. And the minute Jake says that, you know that Jake is gonna be doing that <laughs> within that chapter or at the beginning of the next chapter at the latest. Love it. It's, it's great. It's, it's a wonderful book. Really, really fun. Also has a terrific ending that in which there is a single para paragraph that if you're somebody who reads really quickly, you might almost skip over that throws the entire rest of the narrative into a really interesting light, a perhaps unreliable light. Hmm. Although it's hard, it, it is difficult to say. It, it's, it, there's a lot going on in it for, and this is something I've said about a number of books already, but it's a book where there really is a lot going on for, for a porn book that is extremely subtle and extremely interesting. And, and it would make such a good movie, not that anybody's ever going to make Maneater, but that yeah, I, I would love to see Maneater on a big screen. And that's by, someone's asking the author, that's by Dick Jones, correct? That is by Dick Jones. And I have no idea who Dick Jones was, but, but yeah, it's a great name. There, there are a lot of great pseudonyms. I mean, Rod Rammer is one of my favorites. It, 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 the writers of these books went, you know, alternated between just picking another name and picking really porny names. Barry Lickshaft, I mean, what, what can you say? Right? <laughs> that's great. Yeah, Barry Lickshaft is a really good one. I'll mention too, um, in the, the vein of, of queer joy, um, one of the books that, that I wrote about in, in my essay for, for um, Dangerous Visions uh, is a book called Season of the Witch by a trans woman named Jean Marie Stein, who was writing as Hank Stein at the time. And it is, it's one of the most brutal books I've ever read. It's very difficult to read. Um, it's about a man who who kills a woman during sex and as punishment is himself turned into a woman and the book is the process of coming to terms with that and but it 
it ends up with this incredible outpouring of love and joy. She gets married. She is happy in her female body. This is how she's always supposed to have been. It's just this beautiful ending for what is, you know, was meant to be this kind of mm, intellectual pornographic novel. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's one of the most, I don't know, just really helped me understand the the pain and the anguish, but also the joy of being trans, especially at a time, you know, when, when that was so, so little talked about was considered such a a freakish, dangerous thing to even speak about. Um, Just a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, And that uh, for the chat is called Season of the Witch. um, And it's by Jean Marie Stein. And I think uh, I think you can get like an ebook of it the original which is published under the name Hank Stein is is quite difficult to get um, and that leads me to a question for Maitland um, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your collection you do collect and also publish uh, some of these obscure older gay books why is it important do you think to sort of collect and also to make available again some of these sort of more obscure footnotes seemingly footnotes um in in queer history collecting gay books is an act of preservation gay books i think gay adult books were one of the most disposable of the paperback product Mm -hmm. and paperbacks were meant to be disposable to begin with nobody thought that they were going to build huge important libraries of paperback books and they tend most paperback books and there were certainly exceptions especially reprints of hardcover books in soft cover were meant to be entertainment they were meant to be something that you'd buy at the drugstore or at a rack in the train station or the bus station and you'd read them and you'd throw them away. They, by and large, were not expected to be literature of any kind. And that was true of gay adult books as well. I mean, look, they, they, they were stroke books, first and foremost. That was how they were sold. That is not how all the people who wrote them, all the men who wrote them, treated them. Mm-hmm. You know, some of them did exactly what was expected of them, and others used those books as vehicles to talk about things that they thought were important or that they thought were funny or to explore genres that they enjoyed. But they never really expected people would collect them. And a lot of those books went into the trash. Uh, I have a friend who's not that much younger than I am, maybe 15 years younger than I am, who told me that when he was a teenager, and he already knew he was gay, he wanted to read things about gay people. And the place he wound up doing it was going to 42nd Street and buying adult books. But he said then he would just get in his car, he would drive under the West Side Highway, he would read the whole book, and then he would throw it away because he was still living with his parents. And the idea that that book might out him to his family was one that he, he simply couldn't, he couldn't risk it. I doubt that he was the only person, I don't think I know the only person in the world who did that. And also, and this is a, this is a big thing, I think an awful lot of these vintage gay paperbacks disappeared when gay men died Mm -hmm. and their families came to clean out, you know, bachelor uncle Rick's apartment or house and found these books. I'm pretty sure most of them went into a box or a bag and went to the curb, probably a box, because that way if they got rained on, you, you could guarantee that they would be gone forever. And I'm willing to bet a lot of people took them to the dump so that they wouldn't be anywhere near the house where people might associate them with their family. They, given how many of these books were written and published and printed, the fact that they're not all that easy to find speaks entirely to the fact that an enormous number of them were destroyed. And it's a shame because mm-hmm. no, they are not a history written with a historian's eye. They're a history written on the ground by people who were living lives as gay men and wanted to read and or tell stories about gay men's lives, whether they were serious fiction, which a lot of gay adult books actually are, they're serious fiction with sex, or escapist fiction, horror novels, science fiction, detective stories, westerns, all, all of which are really well represented. Those were very popular genres and they're very well represented in adult books. And those books are a popular history 
of what men aspired to, what things were fantasy things for them. I mean, look, what boy doesn't want to be a cowboy at some point or an astronaut, right? That's just a thing for across all sexualities. So for a gay man who has a gay kid really, really wanted to be a cowboy or wanted to run away and join the circus or wanted to be an astronaut, which certainly in the 60s, everybody, every boy wanted every to boy. be. Yeah. yeah. To see those childhood fantasies embodied in adult fiction, I think was just, a, it, was, it was really appealing. I mean, why does anybody read science fiction or horror or Westerns or medieval fantasies, you know, because they are an escape and one in which you can imagine yourself in one way or another. I, I wanted to point out that there are two recent books that I've read that focus on those paperbacks as objects and their function to the queer community as, a, like I said, those open doors or as ephemera, something that you see once and are electrified by and never see again. One of them was Last Night at the Tel Telegraph Club by Melinda Lowe, which is about the experience of a Chinese American a lesbian living in San Francisco in the 1950s during the Red Scare. Spectacular book. And she finds one lurid lesbian paperback in a drugstore and reads most of it standing at the whirly gig, but dares not take it home because possession is so incriminating. And then spends months trying to find it again as she experiences her first queer relationship, her first lesbian bar, the treatment of the police at the time. It's such a great book. And then second, uh, Passing Strange by Ellen Clages. It specifically talks about a homoerotic cover art from vintage science fiction novels. You know, you have your, your busty women from Mars firing ray guns at each other type thing. And in the same way, it functions as a, a self-authorizing symbol or watchword for queers, not only to find themselves, but to find each other. And I loved seeing both of those authors focus on a very specific piece of queer history and how, how those books were so important and also so fleeting as you described. And it's great that they're being represented in fiction because let's face it, the generation certainly of, of, of people for whom those books were enormously important where, where, when they were young, it's just those people are getting older and older. And so vivid memories of that kind are going to be gone in a couple of decades on a firsthand level. So to it's part of the reason I always wanted to talk about these books and write about them in a, a repertorial kind of way. But, you know, to have them represented in fiction gives them a, a huge opportunity to just keep on being discovered by younger readers. I think that more that young queers know about pieces of our history that are no longer relevant, but still essential to who we are as a people, the better off we'll be. I mean, teach the kids about God, AIDS for sure. And then those tiny little paperbacks and also cruising culture and a million things that we'll never experience and shouldn't experience, but are still so vital to know. Yeah, I teach with these paperbacks a lot and I, I get to see, you know, 18 to 21 year olds uh, responses to them and they're fantastic. It's incredible. Like they, they have not seen things like this. And when they like, when it clicks that like their grandparents, this is like what they had access to. It's, it's wild. Um, okay. So what will likely be our last question? Um, there's an idea, of course, that in science fiction, anything is possible, but are there places where you feel that queer science fiction hasn't gone yet or hasn't gone enough yet in terms of queer desire, queer lives, queer representation? What do you want to see in the future of queer science fiction? I think Meg should take that because I I'm not talking about the future. <laughs> <laughs> I have a huge hobby horse about this, so I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, one of the many gig things that I do because I'm an author living on on making words is I, I work as a, an editor for nonfiction for Uncanny Magazine. And my entire view on these essays that I am collecting and curating and editing is that I love talking about the body in science fiction. I find that the most popular mainstream stories in science fiction pretend that the body does not exist. And I, I find that an extremely distressing turn of events. I know that in our eagerness to be seen as more than ourselves and our, our eagerness to not get our books banned, we stop talking about things like when a character takes a shit and who they want to have sex with. And it ends up 
sanitizing and also exsanguinating our work. So I want to see, and I mean this in no uncertain terms, more fucking in science fiction. I feel like the genre is so bloodless right now. I don't even care who's doing it. I would like to see the straights get it on for once. But we need to stop being afraid of viewing our work as less literary or of less worth because there's sex in it. These things are not mutually exclusive. And I think if you look at the great works of the ancient world or even the great works of the 1970s, that you can find that these two things are not indissoluble. It will work. You can put sex in your books. And on that note, I want to recommend Kellen Spera as an incredibly courageous writer of very sexy gay science fiction books, Docile being uh, the first one that comes to mind and First Become Ashes is the second. Kellen Spera is putting legitimate explicit sex acts into a science fiction novel of literary worth. I would also say that Carmen Maria Machado is excellent about this. Her work is of extreme literary worth. She's a National Book Award <clears throat> finalist. And also the fucking is on the page and they both have the book bannings to show for it. Please God, can I have more of that? And I guess I would like to look back to the books that I've been collecting and say that they are a great model. They're they, they range in quality from the yeah, not so great to the really excellent, but they, they are all books in which sex is an important part of the characters' lives and it's depicted very vividly, mm. very graphically as just, it's part of what they do. And that is in itself normative. And I think it was very normative for readers at that time to see that, you know, this isn't just a porno magazine where you're looking at pictures and maybe there's a little anecdote running along the side of, so I was with my tutor and, and. yeah, fill in any of those incredibly cliched scenarios and, and this happened. They are fully realized books of fiction in which fucking is really important. It's really important to the characters oh, and true. it's really important to the narrative. So uh, these books are doing something that just wasn't being done in any kind of mainstream form. And I applaud them for it. And some of them do it really, really well. And also, if I can just mention that uh, I've just started a Substack newsletter called Maitland's Vintage Gay Book Newsletter. And I would love it if people would come and take a look at it. Right now, it's, it's completely free. And it's, a, again, it's a forum for me to talk about these books and maybe introduce some people who never heard of them, never even thought about whether such a thing existed to the reality that, no, no they weren't all great, but they are all really interesting and absolutely valid and readable all these decades after they were written. Well, I think that is the perfect way to conclude. I mean, more fucking in fiction that <laughs> if you walk away with something, that's the lesson today. So that was amazing. So, so wonderful to talk to you both. Oh, I enjoyed this enormously. I mean, thank you both. This was just a great, a great experience. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you both for being here.